My Dharma is happy to have Professor Savita Ma from Mysore Medical College as a teacher and mentor today. Welcome to you, Ma. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I also welcome our presenter of the day, Dr. Ax Tani, third year MD Pediatrics from Kims Bangalore. Welcome to you also, Thank Doctor. Thank you. And I also welcome everyone who have joined us via Zoom and YouTube. Without any further ado, and with the permission of the mentor, we can start the session. Over to you. Okay, Ax, you can start. Yes, Okay, thank you, ma'am. So my patient, Khadija, is a 13-year, 6-month-old female hailing from Padaranapura who was born on 22nd March 2009. The informant here was a mother who was reliable. She presented with the chief complaints of delayed developmental of milestones noticed since 6 months of age. The mother noticed delayed developmental of milestones first at 6 months of age. However, the child was not well even prior to that. Since there's a developmental delay and on direct questioning, there is an obvious postnatal insult. Hence, I would like to analyze the history from the antenatal history in this case. Coming to the birth history, the married life was of six years. The mother's age at the time of pregnancy was 25 years. Father's age was 29. She is the second child of a non consanguineous married couple. The preconception of folic acid was not taken in this case. It was a registered case with the number of antenatal visits being six. The weight gain during pregnancy was 9 kgs. Coming to the first trimester, the pregnancy was confirmed by UPT at 3 weeks after being having uh, her missed periods. Single dose of TD was taken. Folic acid tablets were taken. There was no history of any radiation exposure. No history of fever with rashes. No history of alcohol consumption during pregnancy. No history suggests of any active or passive smoking during pregnancy. No history of maternal hypothyroidism. And the date and scan was done at 10 weeks. Coming to the second trimester, the quickening was felt at 20 weeks. Iron and folic acid tablets were taken. Anomaly scan was done at 20 weeks, which was said to be normal. OGCT done was normal. Second dose of TD was taken. No history suggested of any headache, blurring of vision, pedal edema. No history of leak PV or bleeding PV. Coming to the third trimester, she continued to perceive the fetal movements well. There was no history of headache, blurring of vision, pedal edema. No history of leak PV or bleeding PV. No history of fever or UTI. Growth scan was done at 33 weeks and was said to be normal. Coming to the natal history, it was a full-term LSCS in view of non-progression of labor delivered at Vani Vilas Hospital. Birth weight was 2.65 kgs. The baby did not cry immediately after birth. Resuscitation done. Details were not completely known to the mother. The baby was intubated in the labor room and shifted to NICU immediately after birth and was connected to the ventilator in view of breathing difficulty as said by the mother. On day two of life, the child had multiple convulsions. Express breast milk was started on day five of life. Direct breastfeeding was started on day 18 of life. The child was kept in NICU for 23 days. The baby was discharged from NICU on day 23 of life and was advised to continue anticonvulsants and follow up regularly. Stopped anticonvulsants by three months without follow up. At six months of age, mother noticed that the baby had no neck control attained compared to the older sibling for which she visited the local clinic and was advised to restart anticonvulsants. The mother also felt that all four limbs were stiff while giving bath and changing clothes. By eight months of age, the child had attained neck holding and was able to talk monosyllables by one year of age. At three years, the child was able to sit without support. At four years, the child started walking with support. Child was put in special school and physiotherapy was continued. The child had one more episode of generalized tonic clonic convulsions around seven years of age, which lasted for five minutes, after which the child was seizure free till now. And anticonvulsants have been stopped three years back, that is in 2017, after advice by a neurologist. At eight years, she started walking independently and was able to tell two to three word sentences clearly and responds to commands given by the mother. She has not attained bladder and bowel control yet. She is able to eat by herself since the age of 8 years, but takes time. There is no history of regression of attained milestones, no history of emotional disturbances or aggressive behavior, no history of any impaired awareness, no history of early hand preference, no history of loss of difficulty in following basic commands and doing daily activities at home. 
the child does not have any difficulty in recognizing the smell of commonly used things at home the child does not have any difficulty in seeing near and distant objects mother also noted a deviation of the eyes while fixating but child was able to follow the moving objects the child does not have any difficulty in chewing there is no history of deviation of angle of mouth or drooling of saliva the child is able to understand when spoken to and doesn't have any ringing sensation in the ears or vertigo no history of nasal regurgitation and nasal twang of the voice the child is able to swallow the food given without any difficulty and was continued breastfeeding till 2 years of life there is no history of difficulty in neck movements and no history of deviation of the tongue the child is able to perceive touch he appreciate pain appreciate hot and cold temperature the child is able to lift the hands above the head and able to mix the food but with difficulty also is able to get up from the sitting position with support and is able to hold on to slippers while walking there is no history of any involuntary movements no history of any constipation or recurrent respiratory tract infections initially the child was bedridden till 2 years now the child is able to do certain activities of daily living with mother's help should i continue ma'am yeah you please continue we'll discuss okay. later Okay, ma'am. So coming to the past history, the fracture of elbow had happened at seven years of age when she fell from the bed, for which she was treated conservatively. Coming to the family history, the mother's age is thirty-eight years now, and for her father's age is forty-two years. It was a non-consanguineous marriage couple. The child is thirteen years at present. Coming to the immunization history, it is completed as per the national immunization schedule. Coming to the developmental history, the developmental quotient in the gross motor is fifteen percent, with the latest milestone being walking up and down the stairs with two feet per step, which was attained at five years. At fine motor, the developmental quotient is twelve percent, the latest milestone being scribbles, which was attained at three years of age. In language, the developmental quotient is sixteen percent, with the latest milestone being two word sentences, which was achieved at seven years of age. in social the developmental quotient is 24% with the last milestone being that she knows her name and recognizes at the age of 9 years since there is a developmental delay in two and more domains so i'll be referring to it as a global developmental delay coming to the diet history there is a deficiency in 625 kilocalories and there is no deficiency in proteins in her diet Coming to the socio-economic history, she belongs to the upper lower class as per modified Kupferswami classification. Summarizing the case, a 13-year-old female child, second born to a non-consanguineous married couple, has a global developmental delay that is static, probably due to a postnatal insult of perinatal asphyxia (HIE stage 2) based on the history, with history of epilepsy, and is completely immunized as per national immunization schedule. and belongs to the upper lower social economic status no no don't go for examination okay uh, go back go back to your presenting complaint slide yes ma'am see here she has come with delayed milestones so now here at this point generally students make a mistake of writing delayed developmental milestones note from birth so that mistake acts as not done so generally the mother will notice somewhere around 5 to 6 months of age uh, so don't try delayed milestones since birth so this mother has noticed delayed developmental milestones since 6 months of age okay go to the next slide okay yes common question the students ask uh, is ma'am if there is a developmental delay should i start from antenatal history or should i go for the developmental history so what generally the uh, what we say as examiners is if there is a significant perinatal history then you better start from antenatal history if there is no significant perinatal history you can start with the developmental milestones direct 
Now he has pointed out that very well. He has said that because there is some significant perinatal insert, he wants to go with. Uh, you have written postnatal insert. If there is a significant perinatal insert, he wants to go with the uh, antenatal history. So you better always present like this. I also appreciate this type of presentation in this slide. Next slide. Yes. Uh, what is your comment on the weight gain during pregnancy? Ma'am, ideally in an Indian setup, 8 to 12 kilos is considered as adequate, ma'am. Yes. So, so here. She lies in the adequate range, ma'am. Yeah, 8 to 12, 9 to 11. Some books also give 9 to 11. Though it is in the lower limit of normal, it is okay. Now, married life is six years. And is this the first child? The second child, ma'am. Second child, okay. If it is the first child, you should also comment if she is not taking any birth control measures, relative infertility is also a risk factor for cerebral palsy. So that should be commented here. If it is a second child, that is fine. Next. Next slide. Okay. Now, you said there is a uh, no history of radiation exposure. Can you tell me what is the recommended radiation during pregnancy? Recommended meaning the upper limit, the allowed, maximum allowed radiation during pregnancy. As per studies, uh, less than 500 is considered as adequate uh, as, um, as a maximum upper limit, ma'am. Between 1,000 to 3,000, they do not have 500 have... millirads, ma'am. Yes, very good. Huh. Continue. Between 1,000 to 3,000, they do not have enough uh, studies to comment, ma'am. And more than mm -hmm. 10,000 is considered as an indication for abortion, ma'am. Okay. How much does an X-ray produce? How much of radiation? Ma'am, one X-ray uh, produces 1 millirad exposure, ma'am. 100, 100. Maximum. It varies with the type of X-ray. The maximum is 100 millirads. Okay, now you said fever with rashes. Why did you ask for fever with rashes? Um, I'm thinking of torch infections, ma'am. In this case, when I'm asking for fever with rashes, as the torch infections also is one of the significant antenatal risk factors for cerebral palsy, ma'am. Okay, yes. Alcohol consumption, again, uh, why? Again, ma'am, fetal alcohol syndrome can present again with microcephaly, midfacial hypophagias, and developmental delays, ma'am. So since oh. there is a history of developmental delays, I would like to ask for alcohol consumption, ma'am. Why smoking? Uh, smoking can again cause uh, intrauterine restriction. IUGR can be uh, one of the factors which can again lead to developmental delay. So smoking can precipitate that and also it can also cause intrauterine insufficiencies. Uh, again, can cause developmental delays. Anything important you have missed in this slide in the first trimester insults? Because I think next you have gone to the next slide for the second trimester. Yes, ma'am. Um, Anything you have missed here? Important. If she had used any reproductive techniques, ma'am, is it? In relation to CP, any uh, single pregnancy, ma'am. Drug intake. Okay. Any drug intake. I, did, I didn't see. Probably you knew by oversight you must have missed. Her. But tell me some drugs, drug intake during pregnancy, which will cause CP in the child. CP or say global developmental delay in the child. Okay. Um, uh, phenytoin, fetal hydantoin yes. syndrome. Fetal hydantoin syndrome can be sodium valproate. Yes. So usually it is like example, phenytoin can cause microcephaly in the child and cerebral palsy. So drug intake is another important history which you should have taken here. Otherwise, the slide is okay. Go for the next slide. Yes. Uh, anomaly scan done and why did you ask headache, blurring of vision and pedal edema? Um, again, to rule out uh, pregnancy induced hypertension and preeclampsias in this case oh. as that can again cause intrauterine insufficiency IUGR which can be a spreading factor for developmental delay and cerebral palsy. Why bleeding PV? Again, if there is any bleeding PV man, that can also cause uh, risk of abortion, threatened abortion and uh, even preterm so pregnancies can also cause. She is in the second trimester, no? She is in the second trimester. So, any placental insufficiency there 
for a UGR and all that. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide. Why did you ask fever or urinary tract infection in the third trimester? And because chorioamnionitis itself is a risk factor for cerebral palsy, ma'am. So mm. history of uh, fever and UTIs which can predispose to chorioamnionitis. I want to ask that. There, to there is no chorioamnionitis. Is per se fever also dangerous can produce EP? Yes, ma'am. Fever itself can produce an increase in the IL-6 which is found to cause a pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, response in the brain of a developing child and can cause damage, ma'am. Yes, fine. Very good. Go for the next slide. So when do you say in this child, probably non-progression of labor, they have taken for LSES, they said. So you should, uh, by history, try to put duration of labor. So when do you say prolonged labor? In a primary, when the second, uh, first stage of labor is more than 18 hours, ma'am, and in a multi, when it is more than 12 hours, in the first stage of labor, I would call it as a prolonged labor, ma'am. First and second stage, because see, this child is 13. There is another definition based on second stage of labor. But here, the, she has delivered 13 years back. So mother will not know when membranes ruptured and all, they may not remember. But most often, they'll remember the onset of labor pains and the delivery. So the first and the second stage club, more than 18 hours is taken as prolonged labor. So roughly, if you can, you should find out when the labor pain started and when the section was delivered uh, to prove that there was a prolonged labor. Okay. Okay. Now this baby, the mother uh, has told that the child did not cry after birth and the baby was shifted to NICO. Now, suppose we'll presume this child did, had cried immediately after birth. Okay. okay. So, if there is no birth asphyxia history, can you label him as CP? Yes, ma'am. Uh, birth asphyxia cerebral contributes to less than between, 10. Uh, link between birth asphyxia and cerebral palsy. Birth asphyxia contributes to less than 10% of cases of cerebral palsy, ma'am. With mm. the majority of the risk factors being antenatal, 80% of uh, cases of cerebral palsy have the risk factor being antenatal cause, ma'am. So, uh, just a mere absence of birth asphyxia itself will not help us to rule out CP mom, in this child. Very good. Very good. Second question is, the mother will say, okay, my now in this particular child, well, the baby has not cried immediately after birth. Now, you want to attribute all birth asphyxias as cause for CP? No, ma'am. In cases of birth asphyxia, when you uh, when you further stage it according to Sanat and Sanat, HI stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3, uh, the mm. uh, first stage has a very good prognosis. The second stage can 50% of the cases can have residual defects. 50% will have no residual defects. In the third stage, there is 80% chance of mortality. And the 20% cases who survive, out of them, 50% of them will have residual defects, ma'am. So okay. based on those, the staging, we can actually have an idea about the uh, risk for cerebral palsy in this case. Fine. Very good. I accept. Now, uh, I came to know that you are a third year PG. So, in... Want to no, develop hear you, in any child, are you? Am I be? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Now, yes, ma'am. Now you're yeah. audible, ma'am. Thank you. Have you ever seen a birth asphyxia stage one child going on to develop CP in your no, three in years of training? In my experience, ma'am, I haven't, ma'am. In the okay. cases I've seen, I'll tell you my experience. In my yes. experience, I have seen many cases wherein it is just a birth asphyxia stage one and you would have developed the CP. How do you explain that? And up, uh, apart from birth asphyxia, other causes also at the same time, like a uh, child might not have been fed initially. So hypoglycemia, that could have also caused a cerebral palsy. Oh, not really just presume the there is no other etiology, no other thing like jaundice, of um, uh, meningitis, no other insults are there. There is just a birth asphyxia stage one. HIE so stage one can also predispose to coagulopathies, ma'am, that can cause hemorrhages and that can cause hemiplegic type of CP, ma'am. 
Okay, that apart, what answer I was expecting was, I'll come back to your hemiplegic CP later, that it is not often the birth asphyxia which produces CP, it is the underlying cerebral malformation which is important. Sometimes an underlying cerebral malformation will produce CP, whereas clinically it may be just a birth asphyxia stage one. So, okay, birth yeah. asphyxia, what you said is correct. More severe the encephalopathy, more the risk of damage. But sometimes when there is an underlying cerebral malformation, even a stage one can go on to develop a cerebral palsy when there is an underlying cerebral malformation. Okay, ma'am. Okay, yes. Next, continue. So you analyze this history in the immediate perinatal period. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the baby was incubated in labor room and shifted to an ICU immediately after birth which means that there is a significant perinatal event which has happened, probably birth asphyxia going into HIE. Uh, the staging is not yet understood, so, but the child has their D2 convulsions. Usually D2 convulsions are associated with metabolic causes, but since there is birth asphyxia, it could also be related to birth asphyxia in this case. And if it is, uh, if it is so, then it comes to HIE stage two as a minimum. The express breast milk was started on day five of life, which is actually a good prognostic factor here. Anything which is uh, started before 14 days is said to be a good prognostic factor in cases of developmental delay and cerebral palsy. And the child was kept uh, in NICU for 23 days and then discharged. So with this, it looks like HIE what stage? A uh, Stage 2, ma'am. Stage 2. So you should have little bit asked about the activity of the, when the mother saw the child, how was the activity of the child? Was she allowed inside... ICU, what else, any other counseling was done. So little bit you should have elaborated. Was he floppy, lethargic all the time? Like when on day 5, between day 5 and day 18 or at day 18, how was the activity? So those things also little bit you could have elaborated. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. And then uh, if the mother has told you, fine. But one word what I want to tell you in the exam is you stick to mother's word words. Like she may not have uh, told you that he was intubated and shifted to NICU and all that. Generally, the mothers will not be that intelligent. This mother may have told you. But one word what I want to tell you is when you are describing, you should stick to mother's words. Okay. okay? In history. Okay. Yes. Next. Next slide. What are the other causes for day two convulsions? Day two causes, day two conversions are usually seen with metabolic, ma'am. Mm. Like early onset hypoglycemia, uh, early onset hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, hypomagnesemia, pyridoxine deficiencies. Mm. Anything and else? apart from that, um, day two conversions, uh, early onset sepsis can usually present on day three, ma'am. But rarely it can also present on day two conversions. Yes, yes meningitis sometimes can have. Yes. Okay. Next. Con uh, now, this child was on anti-epileptics and uh, she, it was stopped at on, day, on three months of life. So, can you just tell me, if this child were to be under follow-up with you, when will you stop anticonvulsants in a birth asphyxia child? And how do you decide on stopping on anticonvulsants? Ma'am, according to the most recent research, I, uh, in the uh, neonatology journals, ma'am, they have mentioned that even at the time of discharge, an, ambu an amplitude EEG, if it shows that there's no activity and the child has no, not had any further convulsions, we can stop the anticonvulsants, ma'am, and then discharge the patient. But the child or should be neurologically stable and without any neurological deficits, ma'am. Yes. If he is neurologically normal, you can. Uh, stop even at discharge. Fine. Okay. Next. Next slide. Now, this mother has said that uh, at the age of, I will presume this is at six months of age, that all yes, their four limbs were stiff while giving bath and changing clothes. What does that tell you? Ma'am, it means that the extensive adductor tone was present in this case, ma'am, because of the extensive attraction. 
the uh, mother was having difficulty in changing the clothes ma'am and also the stiffness indicates spasticity that is a tone is increasing in this case ma'am so it indicates an upper motor neuron involvement just a minute so if could it be in a child with cerebral palsy because you are answering very well i'm asking when do you anticipate let it be a spastic cp when do you anticipate spasticity ma'am initially there will be the phase of hypotonia which mm. will then progress over to spasticity it is an evolving type of cp ma'am yes. so usually by uh, by the age of 6 months to 1 year you will start seeing the signs of cp and by 2 years it will be very evident from the spasticity and the other features of cp so don't you think that at 6 months it's not at 6 months usually after 1 year you tend to get spasticity 6 months is bit too early so what else it could be that's what i'm telling see 6 months it could is... also be a convulsion ma'am oh, sorry a uh, seizure ma'am no no In... she is very very clear no mother he becomes stiff when i'm giving bath when changing clothes sir. that is when i'm handling the child is becoming stiff uh, so that uh, dystonia be it could also be a uh, uh, movement disorder very, like dystonia ma'am very good so in the time table of cp of occurrence of findings where will you fit dystonia meaning when will you get dystonia yes ma'am initially in case of dyskinetic cp also we will have an evolving cp which starts off with hypotonia then mm-hmm. between 6 months to 2 years the child will have alternating of hypotonia with hypertonia ma'am that is when the dystonia sets in ma'am is dystonia different from spasticity or same as spasticity it is different from spasticity ma'am where spasticity is an increase in where is the lesion in dystonia where is the lesion in uh, this one spasticity dystonia is particularly localized to the extra pyramidal ma'am extra pyramidal involving that is a basal ganglia oh. uh, if you're talking about hie then it would be involving the putam in ma'am in case Good. of basal ganglia that will Good. cause dystonia okay now you tell is this dystonia or is this spasticity or in direct words history wise how do you differentiate a dystonia from spasticity spasticity will be present throughout ma'am during all the times even in, in rest when the baby is sleeping also when the baby is having any activities but uh, dystonia will be seen only when there is an active child ma'am it will not be there during rest when you do when you stimulate the child for any movement right. that is when the child will have more movements and more dystonia ma'am very good so here if the history is like the child is become otherwise okay he is becoming stiff when i handle the baby for giving bath for changing clothes and at a very early age at 6 months of age dystonia should be the first one and second is spasticity dystonia okay, should be ma'am. first because if it is occurring all the time so you should elaborate on that history is it that the child is sleeping also is stiff or is otherwise fine when i handle me becomes stiff and he goes into opisthotonus posturing so all this is more with crying all this is more a dystonia difficulty in putting diapers is more a uh, only diapers is more a spasticity of a spastic diplegia so this i feel is more a dystonia tell me some insults which produce dystonia yes ma'am so dystonia can be produced either if it is involving the putamen or the globus pallidus putamen is more involved in cases of hie ma'am and birth asphyxia whereas mm-hmm. globus pallidus is more involved in cases of hyperbilirubinemia ma'am very so, good very good so putamen and ventrolateral thalamus are more affected when there is birth asphyxia it could be that this child with significant birth asphyxia i personally feel this could be dystonia second dd can keep spasticity okay yes okay, ma'am. now coming to the next things see what you have done is you have like broadly gone around telling about gross motor milestones and then describe the development history in detail you can do this or what you can do is uh, uh, you can tell in the exam that sir because this child has come with delayed milestones i would like to explain the delayed milestones history in detail and then go for gross motor fine motor social language everything you put in here including the dq and all that and the assessment under hopi when you go to development history you can just tell i have already described under hopi it's just that you are going in an order because 
it says presenting complaints in all the four domains you should tell you got my okay. point yes this is not wrong this is not wrong but there is duplication here that's why yes ma'am huh? okay, okay. Fine. yes ma'am next slide uh -huh. just a minute in this slide you have put in a word that the physiotherapy was done for this child okay yes ma'am so you should once see physiotherapy we all know as pediatricians and you as a pediatric pg that it's a very important aspect of management of uh, cp child so you should write is physiotherapy at what age it started under whose guidance she is doing like is she regularly visiting a physiotherapist and where she is getting it done and at home obviously she will be doing once in three months she will be going to a physiotherapist is she doing optimum physiotherapy what do you mean by optimum physiotherapy she should do it three times a day one joint above and one joint below uh, at least for 10 minutes so is she doing that physiotherapy properly because in management you have to add that this though this mother is doing physiotherapy nobody is guiding her she has just got it done once for three years or four years back and she's doing on her own and these are the mistakes so like that the physiotherapy should be elaborated about the quality of physiotherapy she's doing okay, okay? yes next yes, slide next slide Now, this child has had one, she, he was totally normal till seven years and then one episode of seizures and then after that he has never had seizures. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So, now, in which type of CP seizures are very common and in which type of CP they are rare? Yes, ma'am. So, in uh, spastic quadriplegia, ma'am, it is there has a 90% chance of getting seizures in case of hemiplegia, there's 33% chance of getting seizures. And in case of dyskinetic CP, there's 25% chance of getting seizures, ma'am. It is relatively rare in cases of spastic diplegia, ma'am. Very good. So here it looks like it is not that uh, frequent here. Okay? Yes. Should okay. I move to the next, next slide, ma'am? Next, next, next slide. Okay, ma'am. Yes. Can you tell me why you have got the, uh, asked these histories? Yes, ma'am. So, no history of regression of attained milestones to rule out a neuroregression disorder. No history of any emotional disturbances, tell aggressive me, behavior. Tell yes, me which neurodegenerative disease presents with initially delayed milestones at six months of age. Ma'am, early onset of uh, delayed milestones is seen in case of Crabbe's disease, adrenoleukodystrophies of infantile type. Mm. Also, deep management disorders can present within six months. Now. Tay Sachs, Crabes, MLDs can also present very early. Huh? And as you said, yes, DAD, infantile variant. So, these are some of the NDDs which can masquerade initially with delayed milestones or can be mistaken for a CP. Yes. No history of emotional disturbances or aggressive behavior. Here I'm uh, looking for upper motor neuron, uh, which will also have pseudobulbar palsy causing labile emotions. Yes. No history of impaired awareness uh, to look for the uh, overall awareness and consciousness and activity of the cortical lobes. No history of early hand preference to look for hemiplegia, which will have hemi hemiplegic type of CP will have early hand preferences. And what no is history early of loss hand of preference? Uh, usually early. hand preference is developed by two to three years of age, ma'am. If the child develops a uh, hand preference before that, usually like less than one year, then it is termed as early hand preference and that indicates that the other side is having weakness, like in case of hemiplegic CP. Yes, continue. No history of loss of difficulty in following basic commands and doing daily activities at home, ma'am. This is to look at the functional aspect of the cerebral palsy case. Sure. Daily activities need to be stressed. See how physiotherapy is important in a child of CP, our second uh, important thing is to bring the child into the mainstream. At least he should be able to do his day-to-day -day activity. So what are the day-to-day -day activities he's doing on his own and what needs assistance? Like brushing of teeth, taking bath, uh, eating, 
then dressing himself up. So these uh, going to the toilet. So these basic activities of daily living is doing, but how he is doing, you will have to put. And also you will have to put a GMFCS. I, I think you know about GMFCS grading. Gross yes. motor functional classification system, you know, classification. Yes, Sir, shall I skip? So that to put that classification, you should be knowing how is the child ambulant? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So if he is ambulant, is he walking in community settings? Community settings means when there is too much of overcrowding, can he walk between those people? Can he climb stairs? Can he climb stairs individually? Then is there irregular payment? Can he walk? All this is required for GMFCS classification. So daily activities and functional classification has to be done a bit more in detail in a CP child. Okay. okay. Yes, yes, next. Uh, I think you have asked all this for cranial nerve involvement. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, I will skip. Do you have any doubts to ask me in this no, slide? No. About, okay, fine. We will skip this. Now, okay. suppose, tell me the common cranial nerves affected in a CP child. Yes, so uh, cranial nerve involvement, it can usually have a non uh, non palliative squint, ma'am. Concomitant squint can be present yes. in a CP child. That is one thing, ma'am. Apart from that, um, specific to cranial nerves, ma'am. Um, deafness is uh, the involvement of deafness, the involvement of vision, the yes. involvement of pseudobulbar palsy causing uh, also regurgitation. Now, yes, correct. Now your child is having deviation of eyes, means what is your interpretation? It's a concomitant squint, ma'am, which is seen in this case, which is common in case of cerebral palsy. Which type of CP squint is common? Ma'am, it is case in a spastic diplegia, ma'am. Yes. More ma common. Go for the next slide. Yes, next slide. Okay, the sensory involvement you have asked. And now this child, you have analyzed his weakness. Huh? So. Yes, now, what do you think is the uh, analysis of his weakness? So, the child here is uh, having a weakness, which is, uh, there's a developmental delay, ma'am, which is there in all the four uh, domains, as we've seen in the developmental history. And uh, there is a weakness here, which is uh, mainly because in the, of an increased tone, ma'am, a spasticity that is causing the weakness, ma'am. And that's why the child had a delayed development in, and delayed gross motor milestones. No, uh, only this slide. Is it proximal weakness or distal weakness? No, the child is able to lift the hands above the head, which okay. means there's no proximal problem. And the child is also able to mix the food with difficulty. That is, That means it's a more of distal weakness. Ma so what is because that? Of problem, because of contractures in CP can cause uh, distal problems, ma'am. What is the typical, uh, so what, what are the causes for distal weakness? Uh, so when there's a distal weakness, ma'am, it can either be a lower motor neuron type of this thing which, or a which, peripheral nerve involvement. Yes, good. One is peripheral neuropathy. Uh, what else can, so are you thinking of peripheral neuropathy here? Uh, no, ma'am, there's no oh. loss of sensations, no blow and stuff, fatting, so, fat or not. put the lesion in this child, in the cortex or in the lower motor neuron? This is in the upper motor neuron. Okay. So leave off. It's unlikely to peripheral. So why is he then having the, the distal weakness? Um, uh, probably because of increased spasticity and contractures, which is causing a difficulty now. Because this of lack of proper adequate physiotherapy. Describe to me a typical pyramidal weakness. Yes. So pyramidal weakness will usually have more problems in the proximal rather than the distal. And also, they will be having a spasticity rather than a rigidity. No, no, no. I mean, my question is, I am not asking about tone. Describe me a typical distribution of pyramidal weakness. Uh, the flexors in cases of the upper limbs and the uh, extensors in the case of lower limbs. For tone, tone. I am asking okay. for weakness. Tone is different. Anti-gravity muscles, tone is correct. So, the weakness in pyramidal is predominantly distal along with flexion and shoulder abduction. So whatever okay. is having predominantly distal weakness is going more towards a 
pyramidal tract involvement. Probably it's a pyramidal tract involvement. Now here, upper limb is more involved or lower limb is more involved? Um, uh, as we can see here, ma'am, the upper limb he is having a contracture. Otherwise, the lower limb was the one which was more involved in this case, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I have not seen on examination. This history is holding his slippers while walking, not sitting, only typically distal weakness. Here, this history looks more like upper limb more involved. I don't know. Contracture, yes, I may pick up later. I don't know. So, if the upper limb is more involved, what type of CP it is? Ma'am, double hemiplegia type of CP, ma'am. When all the four limbs are involved, with the upper limbs being involved more than the lower limbs, ma'am. What happens in quadriplegia? Quadriplegia, ma'am, all the four limbs are involved, along with the involvement of the axial, the trunk, the neck. No, sometimes axial trunk always may not be affected. But still, even in quadriplegia, upper limb may be affected. I'll tell you later how to differentiate between a spastic quadriplegia and a double hemiplegia. They look okay. similar in both upper limb is involved. But then you will have to differentiate between the two that we will discuss on examination. Okay, this could okay. still be for me, upper limb more involved, more of distal weakness. I don't know about contractures. So I want to take it as a spastic quadriplegia. Yes, next slide. Why you have asked the constipation and all that? Um, it is one of the uh, frequent associated complications in case of a CP child ma because of the in uh, the sphincters are not coordinated. Ma the sphincters are not coordinated and there's dismobility of the intestinal movements that causes constipation. Ma okay, fine. So it's a comorbidity. Tell some comorbidities in CP. Yes, ma'am. So it can be either cognitive deficits, behavioral problems, sensory problems, epilepsy, then uh, pain, feeding problems, GIT problems, micronutrient deficiencies, ocular problems, uh, orthopedic problems. These are the usual comorbidities seen in case of epilepsy. UTI, uh, GRD, recurrent respiratory tract infections, feeding problems. These are also comorbidities. Okay, next. Yes, I think apart from this, because of lack of time, I will only tell few more extra negative histories you need to take. So what are the other negative histories you will take here in this particular child? You said he is walking. He is walking. What type of gait? Is he doing toe walking? Or is he swaying while walking? If he is doing toe walking, that means contracture. Is he swaying while walking? That means ataxia. Okay, so if there okay, is need to, yes. to ask that. And then, uh, what else sensor you have asked? Uh, any involuntary movements you didn't ask? Yes, ma'am. So it's a very important. See, of the main types of CP, dyskinetic is a very important type of CP, no? Yes, ma'am. There was never a negative history on no history of involuntary movements. Okay. Yes, should be asked. So no history of involuntary movements, the type of gait, and then uh, there, there, there should be history of, though there is birth asphyxia, HI stage 2, you should ask any history in the postnatal period of any, any history, no history is a history of meningitis, no history is a history of head trauma. And more important than that, could it be an inborn error of metabolism? Um, uh, an inborn error of metabolism would usually present after the feeding is started, ma'am. So around day 14 yeah, or day 15. around six months, no? Apart yes, from no. that, uh, yes, ma'am, there is no any history of uh, regression of any milestones which will usually present with IEMs, ma'am. No, IEM mean only, all IEM may not have regression of milestones. Tell me some IEMs which are closed DDs for CP. Because, see, in the exam, you will tell. My diagnosis is CP. Is this the only diagnosis we will ask? Tell differential diagnosis. So then generally yes. students go blank there. The close yes, differential diagnosis will be IEM. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in fact, as so, a final PG, you should yes, tell which, is, which IEM is a DD for spastic quadriplegia, which yes, IEM is a DD for dyskinetic CP. For spastic, spastic quadriplegia, ma'am. Uh, yeah, tell. 
yes man spastic quadriplegia like a paroxysmal disorders paresia is much better disease mm. then uh, in case of diplegia arginine is deficiency mm. apart from that uh, in cases of uh, spas- uh, discontinuity type of cp from dopa responsive dystonia uh, that is sigawa's disease also in ca- uh, there is also uh, ियोरिन abnormal color of hair so one line to rule out iem see these okay. are few negative histories you should ask okay next why do you think this child has had fracture ma'am uh, cp children are predisposed to fractures because of lack of exposure to sunlight vitamin d deficiencies and calcium deficiencies ma'am Fine. which Go. makes the bone osteopenic right next slide now this two year old child has died of similar complaints Yes, ma'am. The okay. child also had a delayed development of history okay. before he uh, passed away, and also had seizures, ma'am. Okay. What does that suggest now? The child's uncle has also died of similar complaint. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that case, uh, that child also had a history of HIE, ma'am. Mm. So uh, probably it could just be an incidental HIE finding, which was there in that case and this case as well, ma'am, where the baby did not come immediately after birth. and then uh, had hi stage 2 and then uh, it be disposed no. to development delay and then uh, that no, in no. that case don't make it incidental that will be our second diagnosis before okay, that we should link no yes ma'am. everything so, because he has also had similar complaints birth asphyxia delayed milestones and he has died and he is a uh, close like he is uncle yes ma'am so uh, autosomal recessive kind of uh, ah. disorders Uh, also, I'm like Neiman Pick's disease, Tay Sachs disease, Gaucher's so, disease. Let me take work up. Probably you need to do. Ah, huh? maybe some. Okay. Ah, uh, maybe a uh, autosomal recessive disorder. Maybe if then after ruling out doubt, you can tell incidental. First answer should not be incidental. Okay, ma'am. Next, next. Yes, next. What is your comment? now there is one uh, main uh, uh, go to the next slide next slide there is one before labeling as global developmental delay you should write one more line and then write global developmental delay in development list um, more than two standard deviations or delay which is seen in two domains ma'am no no always your developmental delay should be interpreted in the context of vision and hearing let it be any case in the exam when you are writing developmental history gross motor fine motor personal social language next line should be vision and hearing vision and hearing according to mother is normal okay ma'am. then you write global developmental delay or whatever otherwise if he is say hearing itself is abnormal mother says is i think he is not listening to me properly is he is probably deaf then you cannot comment on the language if she yes, says he is not looking at me then you cannot comment on the gross motor this child is not walking probably his vision is affected you would have yes, commented it before but whatever it is the protocol is in any case when you comment on milestone cystic gross motor fine motor social language vision hearing and then the comment okay ma'am okay yeah now what is the and you have written dq for each domain what is the degree of developmental delay it is a uh, severe in this case ma'am as what there is, is more than 66% developmental uh, delay when compared to the chronological age ma'am what does 66% indicate how do you grade indicate... yes ma'am less than 33% is mild ma'am 33 to 66 percent of developmental delay when compared to the chronological age is more a moderate, and more than 66 percent is considered severe developmental delay. Ma'am. What is your reference for that? Um, uh, 
a research paper which is written by Dr. Vaikan Rajasarma no. on cerebral palsy. No, no, you will. There are different classes. The STG guidelines also has given a different uh, the global developmental delay classification, and also there is a uh, like IQ classification you can do for global developmental delay. So more than eighty is seventy uh, to ninety borderline, fifty to seventy mild. Okay. 35 to 50, yeah, that classification, 20 to 35 and less than 20 is profound. Okay. So you have to follow that classification and you have to put what is the grade of the global developmental delay. What is the overall DQ? Here. Mama, the overall DQ, I have not calculated. You have to. Why is it? Okay. Now you tell me what is the importance of calculating overall DQ? Suppose overall DQ is say, 80. Another child overall DQ is at 20. I understood one is profoundly delayed and one is borderline. Which type of CPU get borderline delay? Special diplegia, ma'am. Ah. In which type you get uh, severe delay? Quadriplegia and dyskinetic. Ma ah. Spastic quadriplegia. Dyskinetic you don't get. Spastic quadriplegia. Okay. So, you, we were discussing, no? How to differentiate spastic quadriplegia from double hemiplegia? One That's differentiating right. feature is a profound delay or a severe delay is more towards a spastic quadriplegia. A mild or a borderline delay is more towards a double hemiplegia when all the four limbs are involved. Okay, here okay, it no. is. Otherwise, also you have not calculated. Social is 24%, which is severe. Go to the other two. What, what is the DQ in other two? 16 is very profound other others hmm, 15 12 this is a profound retardation in all the domains almost so this is more a picture of spastic quadriplegia okay now and whenever you write uh, milestones you should write one milestone which is not achieved okay. like walks up or down stairs two feet per step he is not walking down one feet per step so we will note that where he has stopped. And never write in a developmental delay child. Don't write only what he has not achieved or what he has achieved. Don't write scribbling. In the exam, you should write it's a because it's a developmentally delayed child. You should write from the beginning, fine motor, loss of grasp reflex, hand regard, reaching for objects, everything you should write. Okay, ma'am. Huh? Yes. So it should be in detail. Yes. Don't write. Yes, next. And up to what age you use the term global developmental delay? Up to five years, ma'am. Mm. Beyond five years, what term you use? Intellectual disability, ma'am. Yes. So that you should know. In a 13-year-old child. Yes. Next. Yes. Next. Um, uh, can we mention it in this uh, in this part itself, ma'am? Instead of writing global developmental delay, can we mention intellectual disability here itself, ma'am? Yes. It is a 13-year-old. Because he is 13 year old, so you will have to convey to the examiner that before five years, he had global developmental delay. Now he has crossed five years. So all the other milestones beyond five years are also delayed. So query, see, I understood your question. Intellectual disability, you need IQ testing. Understood. Yes. Why they did that global developmental delay less than five years and intellectual disability above five years is because Less than five years, you cannot do IQ testing. Now, less than three years, they are delayed. So that's why they said you had a global developmental delay. About okay. five years, because you can do intellectual uh, tests, you use the term intellectual disability. Now, what you do is, up to five years, he had a global developmental delay. Query intellectual disability. I want to confirm by IQ testing. Like that, you should write. Okay, now. Yes, next. And any feeding difficulty here also you should stress. And it is not, go back. Go back. It is not only the calories and the proteins. These children, not these children, all children will need micronutrients also. So you should write how often he is consuming vegetables, fruits, huh? Non-vegetarian okay, food, if it is okay for them. So this is very important for micronutrient uh, uh, deficiencies that you need not calculate, but you should write okay, vegetables yes, and fruits and all those. 
and any okay. feeding right next here see cp is no is one there is a developmental delay we know it is cp very important is management of cp from the patient's point of view so what i said physiotherapy is she doing optimum how is the activity of daily living all these are important similarly in socio economic history you should include in chronic illnesses especially in cp the kap practices in the mother mother or whoever is the main caretaker meaning okay. knowledge of the mother about the disease meaning she need not tell spastic quadriplegic cp with intellectual disability and all that she should know that there is some problem in the brain of the child i should take him regularly for physiotherapy if he is on ads i should be giving ads like that what is okay. the knowledge mother should not think as the child grows old he'll be okay the because my counseling should start from there so knowledge attitude now she is 13 year old 13 year old child is this is a male or a female child female ma'am ha you didn't tell me about her menarche and all that she is not at menarche yet ma'am should be should be told so okay, is the mother attitude towards the child is she worried about her attaining menarche and the other things is she interested in the child because she is female so those things attitude and practice is she doing physiotherapy because my management should start from kap practices of the mother so apart from routine add kap practices also okay, okay? yes next yes ma'am yes now what is your impression you should write you have just written summary summary i understood what is your impression here Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, since there is a global development delay, ma'am, which is static, and there is a probable cause of it is the parental asphyxia (HA) stage two, and so also there is a history of epilepsy. I would be thinking along lines of spastic quadriplegia, ma'am, in this case, no. as a type of CP. No. Ah, so first tell it is CP. Why do you say okay. it is CP? What is definition okay. of CP? No, no. Cerebral palsy is defined as a group of disorders of which are permanent of movement and posture. Which is arising because of some uh, non-progressive disturbances which occurred in the brain of a fetus or the infant, and which is also associated with other uh, symptom, uh, other features like cognitive problems, behavior problems, epilepsy, secondary musculoskeletal problems. Okay, fine. You told me the definition. Now I want only three things. Is it? It's a non-progressive motor disorder of cerebral origin. It's non-provided. You say it is non-progressive in your patient. because the developmental uh, quotient which is there ma'am it is it hasn't increased it hasn't worsened over the time ma'am it has been static at all at all periods of time we don't know no dq we have not calculated we are we are calculating now one time this is this is just a, a snapshot photograph you have taken you have not done a video no and there's no regression of milestones ma'am very good so that is to you should tell. why you think okay. non progressive because no regression of milestones why do you think motor disorder here according to the developmental question ma'am the motor is more affected in the other domains ma'am the fine yes. motor and the gross so, motor so domains there is some weakness and there is some uh, stiffness and weakness so all this suggest motor disorder so non i would like to think of a non progressive motor disorder of cerebral origin why do you say cerebral origin Uh, because the features of upper motor neuron are more present here, ma'am. Like distal weaknesses, the pyramidal weakness type of pattern is there, ma'am. Rather than also, that, yeah. Ah, uh, there is also epilepsy, which indicates to ah, involvement of cortex, ma'am. Global developmental delay and seizures. These two suggest cortical involvement or a cerebral involvement. So summary end, you should say. I would like to think of a non-progressive motor disorder of cerebral origin. so okay, most probably cerebral palsy which type of cp here now you tell what what type you were telling something um, i have been thinking on the lines of spastic quadriplegia as my first diagnosis here ma'am because mm -hmm. there is involvement of all the four limbs also there is a global developmental delay of a, a profound delay in the cerebrum and there's profound uh, intellectual disability which is also seen in this case 
also apart from that there is a postnatal type of insult of parental asphyxia which predisposes to again a spastic quadriplegic type there is no other history of any abnormal movements so it is not going in favor of dyskinetic type of cp mum also there is epilepsy which also is more common in cases of quadriplegic type of cp mum what is the cause so now you said cp now you said spastic quadriplegia with epilepsy what is the cause due to Uh, probably because of the presence of postnatal and parental insult of parental asphyxia that could be the cause of this cerebral palsy can i go and sue the gynecologist now because pediatrician is telling because of birth asphyxia um, uh, it usually involves both the antenatal and parental factors ma'am it is not just the parental factors which are involved so if the uh, insult could have been started right in the antenatal period itself ma'am so how you tell us cp spastic quadriplegia with epilepsy and all those things due to probably always don't say due to probably due to perinatal asphyxia to rule out cerebral malformation like that okay. you should write because always birth asphyxia is not because of the immediate some obstetrical problem it's most often an underlying cerebral malformation so to rule out cerebral malformation you should, you should write okay ma'am okay dd here you should say what dd you will think of here is uh, it the spastic. only diagnosis uh first thing is it will be spastic uh, quadriparesis ma'am mm. apart from that i would also think uh, since there is hi history it could also still be a dyskinetic type of cp, CP but there is no history of any involuntary movement for okay. cp Uh, apart from that, ma'am, also it could be uh, paralysis, uh, paralysis, much better disease. So inborn errors of metabolism. Okay. There, what okay. we discussed. What are the IEM? Yes, Don't just tell IEM and keep quiet in the exam. So you should be telling what are the other IEMs you are thinking, and you should be able to differentiate them history wise or examination wise. At least few points. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Next exam. You do you have any doubts in the history or anything? No, ma'am. If there are any questions in the chat box, we can take now, or shall we go for examination? Ashra is there, or shall we go for examination? Okay. Continue. Okay. We'll take questions in that. Coming to the general physical examination, a 13-year-old female child, conscious and alert, was examined while sitting comfortably on the bed. Her vitals were a pulse rate of 84 per minute, which was regular in rhythm, normal in volume and character. No radio radial or radio femoral delay. All the peripheral pulses were well felt. A respiratory rate of 26 per minute, thoracic abdominal type of respiration. A blood pressure of 108 by 72 millimeters of mercury, measured in the right upper limb, the supine position. A temperature of 98.6 degree Fahrenheit, and saturation of 98 percent at room air. There was no pallor, ictus, sinusus, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or edema in this child. Coming to the anthropometry, her weight was in the 40th percentage, with just 24 kgs. With her weight age being eight years, her height was less than third percentile, and her height age being 10 years, her head circumference was 47 centimeter, which showed microcephaly. Her BMI was 12.8, and she was found to be underweight. What is the definition of microcephaly? Uh, when the head circumference is less than three hundred centimeter deviation for that age group and the gender, it is said to be microcephaly, ma'am. Less than minus three hundred deviations. See, you should plot on the growth chart. Have you plotted and attached? Uh, no, ma'am. I am not attached it, ma'am. What charts you will use for anthropometry for a thirteen-year-old child? And the IAP growth charts are used, ma'am. Um, right. About five years, less than five years, we use WHO growth charts. Yes, fine. In the exam, also you should attach uh, the plotted growth charts. PG okay. will expect you to plot and attach to the case sheet. Yes, next. Coming to the head to do examination, the head revealed microcephaly. The hair was normal. How do you yes, know? Uh, uh, just a minute. How do you know it is microcephaly? It can be. What is the? Uh, where else you get small head? Um, syndrome features associated with cerebral palsy, like in cases of Corneal de Lange syndrome, Down syndrome, Angelman syndrome. That's all microcephaly, no. I'm not asking syndromes. In all those. Touch infections, ma'am. 
in all those there will be microcephaly what is another dd for small head a craniosynostosis ma hmm. how do you differentiate With see because you have written head microcephaly plus all these questions arised small head is not equal to microcephaly small head can be microcephaly can be craniosynostosis how do you differentiate a craniosynostosis from microcephaly yes ma'am so uh, on by the history also craniosynostosis will not have cases like developmental delay ma'am the child also will not be having any symptoms like uh, seizures whereas in case of microcephaly related to these condition they will have also there is a primary versus secondary microcephaly ma'am they will also have a receding no, forehead no, no. in case of My primary microcephaly straight forward craniosynostosis if it is long standing can also have global developmental de delay and all that just in ex you are in examination head to toe examination how do you differentiate microcephaly from craniosynostosis there will be overriding of the sutures ah, will be same ma'am in case you don't call overriding ridging of sutures ah, that means okay. same overriding and what else another point to say my craniosynostosis there will be abnormal shape of skull like okay. scaphocephaly you have many ah, brachycephaly yes, paracephaly trigonocephaly so many abnormal shapes of skull and ridging of sutures so you should not write microcephaly plus you should write head no abnormal shape of skull no ridging of sutures ha huh? microcephaly present at the brain ha huh? okay ma'am sorry ma'am hmm. hmm. uh, coming to the eyes uh, it was normal there was no cataract no cherry red spot no choreoretinitis no corneal clouding mouth tooth caries were present and crowding of teeth was seen ears were normal with no lower set ears nose was normal and neck was normal next coming to the extremities Uh, there was a dynamic contracture of the right wrist, which was seen. No other abnormality is seen. The chest how was normal, spine was normal. How do you differentiate a dynamic contracture from a static contracture? Yes, ma'am. When you do uh, the angles of R two and R one, ma'am, if uh -huh. the uh, R two is R two minus R one is a big number, that is the uh, difference is big. Then it is a case of dynamic contracture, ma'am. Whereas R two minus R one, if it is less, then it is a case of static contracture, ma'am. how to next question is how to say there is a contracture at the at any joint normally normally uh, at the range of movement should be at least more than 10 degree in each joint if the range of movement is less than 10 degree the child is having a contracture then you what is the clinical significance of differentiating dynamic from static Ma'am, uh, in cases of management, ma'am, the dynamic contractures were managed differently from a static contracture. As physiotherapy can be given only for dynamic contractures. For static contractures, the treatment is either tendon longening procedure or uh, you are relaxing the tendon, ma'am. Good, very good. The tendon release yes, um, will be yes. done, ma'am. And also, you can give botulinum toxin injection in dynamic contracture. So management-wise, it is important. Yes, continue. the chest was normal the spine was normal the abdomen was normal genitalia were normal smr stage 2 the skin was normal with no neurocutaneous markers like cephalic spots hypopigmented macules were seen yes next coming to the systemic examination the central nervous system higher mental functions consciousness the patient is conscious and aware to the time place and person appearance be patient is well groomed appropriately dressed sitting comfortably in the chair behavior patient is maintaining eye contact and is cooperative for examination communication auditory and semantic comprehension is preserved the speech is fluent with poor articulation of words naming repetition reading writing could not be assessed in the child there is no delusions or hallucination emotion and the mood is appropriate for the child insight couldn't be assessed now the the mainly here it looks like she is having dysarthria Which type of CP is prone for dysarthria? Mom, uh, pseudo uh, pseudo bulbar palsy, mom, which can be seen in cases of uh, spastic diplegia and spastic quadriplegia. The spastic type of CPs will usually have a spastic kind of dysarthria, which is pseudo bulbar type of dysarthria. Also, cerebellar type of dysarthria can be seen, mom. Yes, what you are telling is right, uh, textbook wise. But most common textbook wise means CNS examination wise cerebellar dysarthria, zero bulbar dysarthria. But in the context of CP, dysarthria is very common with 
discrinetic ct okay ma'am okay, okay. okay next ma memory couldn't be assessed attention couldn't be assessed abstract thinking spatial perception couldn't be assessed the calculations also couldn't be assessed frontal lobe executive functions couldn't be assessed the parietal lobe functions couldn't be assessed is there any over higher uh, ah yeah, continue continue still the temporal lobe functions couldn't be assessed occipital lobe functions couldn't be assessed and frontal release reflexes are not seen in this case you have to also tell about the behavior no behavioral abnormalities did you tell or maybe i did did i miss um uh, initially i just men mentioned that the patient is maintaining eye contact and is cooperative for examination yeah, that behavior. is okay what are the behavioral abnormalities in a ct child they may maintain eye contact and they will be cooperative for examination still what are the behavior abnormalities they can have you are right child could... very important what you have written is see what you are meaning by child is having i contact and is cooperative for examination um uh, cp children are also predisposed to autism spectrum disorders and very adhd type of disorders very good huh? so, so for that i'm asking for contact yes adhd and autism huh? and yes, irritability these things you need to comment yes go next motor system cranial nerves coming to the cranial nerve examination the olfactory nerve the smell could not be assessed Coming to the optic nerve, the child fix, follows and fixates to the light. Color vision could not be assessed. Field of vision could not be assessed. The pupils were equal and reactive to light on both sides. Coming to the fundus examination, it showed a normal retinal vessels with normal optic disc with well-defined margins and no evidence of hemorrhage, exudates, or any cherry red spot seen on both sides. Continue. Coming to the oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerve examination. the alignment of eyes were normal on both sides the conjugate eye movements and the saccadic movements could not be assessed in this child nystagmus was absent on both sides pupil size and the reaction was normal equal and reactive to light on both sides accommodation reflex was present on both sides was there squint because Mom, in this case there something like squint but yes, here you are telling it is normal Go yes back. on uh, Yes, ma'am. On uh, history, the mother had told that there is a uh, squint, ma'am. But we had tried the alignment of eyes uh, with the Hirschberg test, and uh, it did not reveal any uh, malalignment, malalignment of eyes. Okay. Next. Coming to the trigeminal nerve examination, the inspection palpation uh, inspection showed no wasting fasciculations or deviation of jaw on either side. Palpation also revealed no wasting movement against resistance could not be assessed on either side. Reflex of the jaw jerk was exaggerated on both the right and, and the jaw jerk was exaggerated, and the sensation of the face could not be assessed on either side. What does that indicate? Jaw jerk exaggerated. It indicates an upper motor neuron, ma'am. That is a pseudo bulbar type of palsy where we'll get a jaw jerk exaggeration. Fine. Uh, uh, I mean, what does it indicate as far as the severity is concerned? See, you have a spastic diplegia. You have a spastic. Uh, uh, hemiplegia, or a spastic quadriplegia, dyskinetic CP. Which one will have a jaw jerk exaggerated? Ma'am, uh, when it is involving the uh, the fifth and the seventh nerve, which is the no, fifth no, nerve, which no. is there. My question is straightforward. In these four common types of CP, which one you get exaggerated jaw jerk? Spastic type, ma'am. No, no, spastic. You have three types, no? Huh. the spastic quadriplegic type one because yes because of that that indicates diffuse cortical damage jaw jerk exaggerated okay. means so that means it is a feature of spastic quadriplegia you don't get okay. that in a diplegia or a hemiplegia okay yes next okay ma'am coming to the facial nerve examination on inspection the facial you can skip i think it's normal okay ma'am yes, because of lack of time we'll just skip the vestibular cochlear nerve examination is also normal and the, some of the components could not be assessed mm. the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve also the gag reflex was exaggerated here on both sides and uh, coming to the uvula position there was flattening of the palatal sorry there's no flattening of the palatal arch no deviation of the uvula and uh, coming to the pitch and the quality of the child's voice there is spastic dysarthria with no nasal twang there's no difficulty in swallowing of saliva no drooling Yes. Next. 
the spinal and accessory could not be assessed. The hypoglossal did not reveal any no fasciculations or deviations and the movements could not be assessed. So basically, what is the impression of your cranial nerve examination? Only thing abnormal, what I found was jaw jerk exaggerated. Yes, the jaw jerk nerves are normal. Yes, ma'am. Fine. So that we have interpreted it. Go, go to motor system. Okay, ma'am. So coming to the motor system, the bulk of the muscle on inspection, there's no asymmetry on either side, no flattening or bulging. The measurements are found to be equal on both sides. Mm. The tone, coming to the tone, the posture of the child on the right side, there's a flexion deformity in the right wrist. A flexion of the upper and the lower limbs is seen on both sides. Palpation reveals stiffness on both the sides. Again, suggestive of upper motor neuron relation. Passive stretching reveals spasticity on both sides and flappability showed that the movements were reduced, again, indicating spasticity and hyperatonia. Uh, How did you tell that there is a spasticity? Yes, ma'am. So spasticity here, uh, it, uh, there was basically class type type of spasticity which was seen with the flexors, one group of muscles being involved more than the other group of muscle. So again, uh, the flexors here are being involved more in the upper limb. Apart from that, also... Um, uh, it is velocity dependent. So as we see initially that when we are moving it with a little more amount of velocity, there is resistance which is being felt. Whereas right. when we care, uh, when you move it without any distance, when we move it slowly, there is a good range of motion which is seen. Again here, the moment you tell spasticity, I appreciate yes, that you said spasticity. Some students will write hypertonia present. That should not be written. Hypertonia can be rigidity or spasticity. You have not made that mistake. In a CP child, do you want to grade this spasticity? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. By modified Ashwood type of grading, what is you the... like to? Uh, it is a grade for the spasticity which is seen, ma'am. There are no, five no, grades. Patient, what is the grade? In my patient, on the grade which was seen here was grade two, ma'am. There grade is a, a yes, ma'am. In during the range of motion, there is uh, sorry. There is an increased tone which is seen and it is lasting for the, the resistance is felt throughout the range of motion. No. no. You go, you can go and read, but only thing is you go back to your previous previous slide. Yes, ma'am. You said the the limb is held in flexion posture. There is a flexion deformity of upper and lower limbs. Where all yes, is the flexion? Yes, ma'am. So in the lower limb, ma'am, there was hip flexion and knee flexion which was seen mm. in this child. And also uh, in the upper, upper limbs, there was ma'am, upper limb, there was a contracture which was seen in case of the right wrist, ma'am. So you should write where you have uh, flexion deformity, flexion of what joints? Then okay. is there contracture? Why, why is the lower limbs flexed at hip and knee? Is it a dynamic contracture there? Yes, ma'am. There was, uh, there was no. Uh, it is a dynamic type of contraction which is seen in the world. Commented in modified Ashworth scale. If the mm -hmm. limb is held rigid in flexion or extension because of spasticity, it is grade four. Okay, ma'am. So okay. You, you should also write spasticity, and you should write modified Ash Ashworth scale in uh, CP check. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Next slide. Coming to the power, the power was found, found to be 4 by 5. Coming to the reflexes, the deep tendon reflexes. Man, man, go back, go back. Yes, ma'am. Power is 4 by 5 in all limbs. Yes, ma'am. It was so generally found to be 4 by 5. More or lower limbs are more or equal? You feel all are equally distributed? Yes, ma'am. I felt it was 4 by 5 in all the movements okay. of all the muscles. Go ahead, go ahead. Coming to the deep tendon reflexes, ma'am. The biceps was 2 plus on both sides. Triceps was also 2 plus. The knee was 3 plus. And the ankle was 2 plus. The superficial reflexes, the abdominal reflex was absent. No, no, and the minute. plantars was found to be bilateral extension. One minute. Yes, you interpret the DTS. The power is found to be normal in this case, ma'am. And the reflexes here, which are being seen, the deep tendon reflexes are found to be appropriate for the uh, biceps or triceps and the knee also being three plus is found to be appropriate. Now. So you, according to you, uh, knee jerk is not exaggerated. Three plus no, is no. exaggerated if you are using three plus classification. So 
all are normal yes ma'am okay yes next you'll have to give an explanation now okay we'll just finish off the discussion here only now you said there is plasticity okay yes, now you are telling what what happens to dtr in plasticity uh, in human lesion and the reflexes will be present it will not be absent absent will be seen in case of the element type of lesion no no in human type of lesion in human type of lesion what happens to dtr unless there's a contracture in case of contracture it will be absent ma'am uh, mm. uh, uh, apart from that uh, absent apart from that it should be present present or brisk you should be clear yes ma'am sorry uh, if in case in case of human type of lesion the reflexes are usually usually 3 plus or more ma'am it is exaggerated ah, exaggerated so your classification of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus is not correct here 3 plus means it is brisk you can just go okay. and revise that one but what okay. you are telling is all reflexes are normal okay i will yes, take all reflexes as normal so now with the spastic quadriplegia how do you explain the normal dtr it's not absent also to explain as contractures yes so a spastic uh, quadriplegia plus the reflexes uh, being normal in this case ma'am hmm. it means uh, the, um i i am not sure ma'am how to input that so that happens when there is a mixed cp okay sometimes if it is absent it is a contracture if the reflexes are normal you can have a mixed initially and now the combination of probably it is a spasticity plus mixed cp is the only way you can explain the reflexes being normal okay no other way you can explain so you will have to take it as a mixed cp okay we will see next so the superficial reflex the abdominal reflex was absent indicating an upper motor neuron type of lesion and the plantars were found to be bilateral extensor again signifying the same upper motor neuron involvement mm -hmm. the ankle clonus was absent and the gait was seen here was spastic involuntary movements were not seen yes next coming to the sensory system examination proprioception could not be assessed vibration crude touch fine touch could not be assessed the pain was present bilaterally but could not be graded whether it was equal in both sides the temperature could not be assessed now now here go back of course all these are important but very important is where you put the lesion in the upper motor neuron no? where which in the cortex uh, so your cortical sensations are important Yes, ma'am. So, if if she is not intellectually able to tell me, cortical sensations, what you will test? Yes, ma'am. The tactile perception, the two point discrimination, stereognosis, graphesthesia. Yes. Very good. So, if you are able to do, you can do in the child. Otherwise, you should let the examiner know that cortical sense in all children above seven years, we should be doing cortical system, the cortical sensation examination. so cortical senses could not be tested child was not cooperative like that you should be tell you should be telling okay ma'am yes next the cerebellar functions the past pointing could not be assessed position holding could not be assessed dystadiokinesia could not be assessed nystagmus was not seen no tremors were seen no signs of meningeal irritation autonomic nervous system examination was normal primitive reflexes were not seen what primitive reflexes you saw in this child um uh, again we were looking for frontal release reflexes and primitive reflexes like again case of uh, rooting then sucking reflex uh, apart from that also the other primitive reflexes like uh, more uh, sorry uh, stepping reflex how you ma'am yes ma'am i can't hear you ma'am you can't do that only what you can do is like adults how you do adults meaning older children glabellar tap rooting sucking snout reflex those things you need to see okay, okay? yes ma'am okay. yes ma'am no yeah yes ma'am next 
coming to the developmental assessment on gross motor the child walks up and down stairs 2 feet per step the fine motor the patient is able to scribble when given a pen and a paper uh, the social as uh, a child knows her name and responds when called to and on speech the child can speak two word sentences okay does so she is scribbling yes ma'am fine so what is her developmental age now uh uh the developmental age here which is achieved is less than 3 years ma'am so what uh, you you can do is if it is an younger child i'm not talking here generally i'm telling when you get a cp younger child less than 1 year you will have to do amiel tyson tone assessment and 180 degree flip developmental assessment and up to 6 years you will have to use a trivandrum scale for developmental assessment but because here she is 13 year old you can uh, skip that so you should write your interpretation here developmental age of the child is how much ever 3 years or whatever you, your interpretation you should be writing okay ma'am and okay, your dq you should write your assessment okay, dq because what the okay, mother tells is that history she may be overestimating so you should put your dq and your final diagnosis you should tell what is the degree of retardation based on that okay, okay? ma'am i have a doubt here ma'am yes uh, so uh, how do i put my final dq in this place no again do i do an average of the three domains which are seen here or how do i do it ma'am average of all whether in average. this way or on examination you do you have to put a dq for each domain and then you take an average okay ma'am understood ma'am or average developmental age by chronological age average of developmental age chronological age into 100 okay ma'am understood like that you should do. average you should take respiratory okay. system is normal no you can yes ma'am other exam other systems are all found uh, normal uh, no? one minute you you will have to comment did you comment on cranio spinal axis there after many uh, no, times very no, ma'am, in a cp yes, child ma'am. go back i have missed it times. ha ha okay what you will write in crane uh, here no signs of meningeal irritation cranio spinal axis always very important in cranio spinal axis one microcephaly present next uh, spine no tuft of hair and all that next very important in spine in a cp child is scoliosis so any scoliosis postural abnormalities they'll they'll be having this postural abnormal so if there is scoliosis you will have to say structural or in the cooperative child i am telling structural or uh, postural so all these things you should write in a bedridden child again you will have to look for bed sores scoliosis and all these things you should be seeing okay yes okay, other things are normal yes ma'am mm-hmm. shall i give the summary ma'am yeah yeah so it is a 13 year old female child second born to non consanguineous married couple with history suggests of parental asphyxia with motor deficit involving all the four limbs and global developmental delay with convulsions and speech and language difficulty completely immunized as per nis from the upper lower socio economic status on examination the pulse rate was 84 per minute respiratory rate was 26 bp of 102 by 60 mm mercury head to toe examination and anthropometric examination revealed microcephaly under nutrition systemic examination showed no cranial nerve involvement hypotonia of the upper limb more than the lower limb was seen dtrs were exaggerated with no atrophy of the muscles other systems were within normal limits here your findings have changed in summary suddenly there you said all four limbs involved uh, equally when you presented okay. no aksha yes ma'am yes ma'am now you are telling upper limb more than lower limb you said dtr normal um, i was a uh, little asking about the contracture ma'am because of the contracture i wanted to know whether the upper limb is more involved more than the lower should i mention it like that or not no no don't don't uh, see if there is contracture you are not able to assess tone then you don't write hypertonia more in upper limb and lower limbs not able to assess tone in upper limb because of a uh, contracture like that you should write okay if i had a patient in front of me i would have cross checked and told you now whatever you are telling i am uh, assuming it is correct if you feel there is hypertonia more in upper limb you write hypertonia more in upper limb 
If you are not okay. able to assess tone properly in upper limb because of contracture, you write that only. Don't change that to hypertonia okay. more in upper limbs. Okay, ma'am. Okay. And DTS, what should be taken out? Exaggerate uh, I... normal. Only because the knee was found to be three plus here, ma'am. I thought I'll mention it as a exaggerated in this case. But you, what did you tell me? I told no. Three plus is exaggerated. Yes, means you said three is normal according to you. Yes, ma'am. I... According to one plus, I didn't want to go to the basics. According yes, to that, one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus classification. Three plus yes, is exaggerated and four plus is clonus. Yes, ma'am. But you said I, it is normal. exaggerated, ma'am. I'm sorry. Okay, next. What's your diagnosis? So my diagnosis is uh, static encephalopathy with a spastic quadriplegia with intellectual disability with functional grade 2 of max with grade 2 of GMFCS with microcephaly and epileptic disorder with mental age of less than 3 years squint I've mentioned just because of history mum with probably normal hearing with undernourishment with diamic contractures probably etiology being birth asphyxia. See here. Yes ma'am. Those see that do we use the term static encephalopathy now for CP? I am not. It is neither static nor encephalopathy. Why? Because, because some components of CP can be uh, progressive mm -hmm. also, ma'am. Like no, no, no. The no, moment no. the clinical no. features keep changing, so the term static encephalopathy is taken out. So don't use the term static encephalopathy. Nelson has given an explanation why it should not be called static encephalopathy because the clinical features change. As we have discussed, initially hypotonia, later dystonia and uh, uh, spasticity and all that. Though the pathology in the brain is static, now because the clinical features are changing, Nelson says don't use the term static. Then don't use the term encephalopathy because some like spastic diplegia are working at a very uh, uh, good uh, cognitive level with a good uh, occasional, uh, but meaning what I want to say is some spastic diplegias can be incorporated into the society. They are doing some useful work. Some uh, some of our OBGPG ones was a spastic diplegia. We have seen one intern who is a, a dyskinetic CP where they are mentally almost near, no they are near normal only. So they can function at a very high cognitive level. So, static encephalopathy is taken out. So, you write CP only there. Okay, ma'am. So, start with CP. CP should be there in your diagnosis. So, CP with spastic quadriplegia, with intellectual disability, with trade and all that, microcephaly, put a DQ there. Developmental age you should put. With okay, what degree of retardation, profound, severe and all that. See, you, you are... Don't put from history. With on examination, you have found no squint. Means don't write squint. Okay. Squint should be taken out with probably normal hearing. With always vision and hearing should be written with probably atva with no obvious hearing and vision abnormality. Like that you should write. No obvious. Okay. But will you subject this child for Bera? No, ma'am. I haven't. No, you you will you subject. Uh, in cases of mum again diplegia, it is more common to have hearing abnormalities, mum. Like bearers okay, required. It is any CP. Though yes, the mother says my child is hearing normally, will you subject the child for bera, especially when the language is not normal? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So Adike, with probably in I mean whatever you have written is correct. You can write probably Atva with no obvious hearing or vision abnormality from my, whatever my examination, like that. So with okay. probably normal hearing and vision, both you should add. With undernourishment, with dynamic contractures, probably due to birth asphyxia, to rule out cerebral malformation, you should add there. Okay, now. Yeah. Etiology, birth asphyxia, to rule out cerebral malformation because such a child with cerebral malformation is prone for birth asphyxia. Such a child with cerebral malformation is prone for CP. We are sometimes linking birth asphyxia and CP. So you want to rule out cerebral malformation like that. And okay, uh, 
Yes, GMFC, yes, you have written. Fine, I think this should be the diagnosis. Yes, next slide. Over. So investigations yes, in the exam also, briefly one or two lines you should write about investigations and treatment. So here also time is up. So investigations, you should always, once you have written to rule out cerebral malformation, you should get an MRI done. And I think there is one American Academy of Neurology, one article is there, uh, which is standard. Everybody will uh, refer to that about investigations. Do you want to do a genetic workup in this child? Yes, because yes, there is one you. close person relative who has had similar complaints and has died at two years of age. So this child will have a, this one MRI. If he were to be having continuous seizures, you would have told a EEG and then you will get a genetic workup done. So these things you need to include. So what okay. are the indications for genetic workup is one family history. Second, if there is a cerebral malformation like lysencephaly, pachygyria and all that, they are known to get transmitted genetically. By, so that's why you need a genetic workup or uh, when you don't have an obvious etiology. These are the three indications for genetic workup. Then management, you should always tell multidisciplinary with pediatrician in the center. Okay, ma'am. And in the exam, we'll ask for management. As a pediatrician, never forget nutrition, immunization, growth monitoring. Huh? So these things, okay. the basic topics you should not forget. And okay, then uh, don't tell theory in, uh, in the exam. You will have to tell what are the problems. You'll have to list out what are the problems in your patient. Like okay, in this patient, what are the problems? No contractures. So I will involve an orthopedician and a physiotherapist. Spasticity, contracture. There is a, some diet uh, grossly deficient in calories. So I'll involve a dietitian. Some teeth abnormality, you said some caries or something. No. Yes, yes, so I will involve her. So don't tell theory in your patient, list out the points. And then okay. you involve the corresponding multidisciplinary team. You form a multidisciplinary team for your particular patient. Okay, ma'am. Understood, ma'am. Yes. And uh, this child, any other comorbidity, acute problem, she is not having anything now. She came to no. you only for delayed milestones, according to yes, you. Yes, Okay, fine. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry because of lack of time, I should not, I could not go much into the depth of management. If you have any doubts, you can ask me. Thank you very much, ma'am, for the entire discussion. Ma it's been very informative, ma'am. Thank you. And I'll make sure I correct the mistakes, ma'am, before I okay, do the fine. next time. No, it was yeah. actually ups. Very good presentation, very confident presentation. And I'm very happy because as a teacher, I need to add few points. That's all. Yes, the, the only few points extra I've added. Otherwise, uh, in the exam, I would have given you first class for this presentation. Very confident presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any doubts are there in the chat box? Can we take? Or yes, you want to wind up? Uh, in YouTube, we have uh, two uh, doubts, ma'am. First is, what are the problems that children with spastic type of cerebral diplegia develop later in life? Okay. See, mainly spastic diplegia, so we usually ask this question to PGs. If at all, uh, uh, you, you want to have a child, I mean, you are destined to have a child with CP. But you have a choice. Which child you will have? Select means they'll usually select uh, uh, spastic diplegia. Why? Because they'll not have much seizures. Mentally, they are normal. So what problem they will have uh, is mainly motor. So what happens is they'll start having these gait abnormalities. They'll have the scissoring gait. And sometimes they it is called as a crouch knee gait. They'll bend at the knee and they'll start walking. So they'll have contractures because of the spasticity. So, and uh, uh, these are the main problems in a uh, motor problems rather than other comorbidity in a spastic diplegia. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, another doubt. It is, um, is there any role of 
baclofen in spasticity in children with spastic cerebral palsy yes but see always it is the physiotherapy 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 but and also i need to tell that all spasticity means you need not go for physio i mean you need not go for treatment spasticity sometimes will be helping the child as ax was telling now suppose there is a contracture in the elbow if it is helping the child to hold a, 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 i mean to hold a spoon and eat it is in fact helping him then it is okay when will you treat a spasticity is when they have when it is interfering with functioning of of the child when it is interfering for the parents to take care of the child like difficulty in putting diapers or like there is a contracture then you will treat so these are some of the things we should take out from our mind that all spasticity should be treated then baclofen you can give intrathecal baclofen so when there is, but uh, the only thing is this baclofen reduces the seizure threshold so they may start having uh, if it is already a seizure disorder child he may start having seizures again which was under control may become uncontrolled so that we need to think uh, but uh, physiotherapy is the main line of treatment in spasticity then later we can go for a intrathecal baclofen if required yes ma'am uh, that's it for uh, doubts today and it was a, indeed a very comprehensive class ma'am very informative and we could learn a lot because of this discussion ma'am uh, thank you so much and uh, i thank the presenter dr ax uh, we could learn a lot uh, because of your well prepared presentation kudos to you also doctor and um, thank you to all the participants who have joined us we